Well, we're going to continue this morning in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. We're in chapter 2, and uh, we're going to start around, uh, we're, we're going to start at verse 12. We left off there at verse number 12. So what I want to do is I just want to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to read um, down to, um, I think we're going to go probably make it to... Uh, verse 18 and look and see what the what the Lord would have to say to us this morning through this uh, these passages so verse 12 uh, my my Bible uh, has is like a subtitle in the middle of the chapter lights of lights in the world and this is what it says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's do this. Uh, let's just take a minute to pray. And ask God's blessing here this morning on the, on the sermon. Uh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for, um, for bringing us here today. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to open your word and to allow you to speak to us. And, Father, help us, Lord, as we're listening uh, to yield and to surrender to the Holy Spirit as he would deal with us. And our prayer, Lord, is that we would not only be able to understand uh, what it is that, that you would have us do, but that you would also, by your grace and your mercy, help us to be able to live it, to be able to practice it, Lord, to, to be able to do the thing that pleases you. And so that we might be a, a light in the world, a world that's dark, that doesn't know you. So that we might be uh, effective witnesses, Lord, and be able to lead others and share with others uh, the good news of, of Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary's cross. Um, we pray for you, Lord, to um, uh, encourage us. We pray for you, Lord, to give us, Lord, instruction and to help us. Uh, Father, as we um, go through these days that we're living in, Father, we know that you're with us. We know, Lord, that you uh, never leave us, nor will you ever forsake us. And we know, Lord, that you're here with us this morning because of your promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that there you are in the midst. So, Father, thank you for that. And we just pray these things and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So, I think it's important to uh, continue to... I'm going to look for a verse here that I need. I think it's important for us to continue to uh, keep in mind uh, as we go through this epistle, and as we read these verses, uh, that Paul, he did not know what the Roman Empire would make of his impending case. Remember that um, he was um, in prison. He had uh, been chained to, to a guardian. Um, he was waiting for a decision on, on what would become of his life, whether he would live or, or whether he would die a, a martyr. Uh, we see in verse number 23, it's a little bit further than I read, but I wanted to bring it out. Uh, I hope, therefore, to send him, and he's speaking about Epaphroditus, that had come from the church to help him out in his prison in, in, in the situation he was living for. He, he says, I hope... Therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Uh, Paul was hoping that he was going to be able to go back to this church in 
in Philippi. His prayer was that he would continue to be able to be useful to them and minister to them. He was aware, though, that he, he may die. And this is where we get that passage, for me to live is Christ. So if I'm alive, then Christ is my life. And, and if I were to pass, if I were to die, if I were to, he used the word depart, like depart to where? To heaven. He was talking about death then that's gain. So Paul's aware of his situation, but in spite of that circumstance, not very favorable, if you consider it from his perspective, he says in verse 17 and 18, even if, so first he says in verse 23, just as soon as I see how it will go with me, he didn't know. He didn't know what his future held. But he knew, he knew who held his future. Such a cliche, isn't it? We hear that so often. But it's true. None of us know what tomorrow holds. The thing that he had inspiring him and motivating him was that he was there because he was serving the Lord. He was there because he was being obedient to the call that God had placed on his life. So if we're in that position of where we're serving the Lord, we're living for Him, whatever might come our way, we don't know the future. There, and here I go again. But we know who holds the future, right? Is He saying, just, as soon as I know what's going to happen to me, um, you know, I'll, I hope I, I can send Epaphroditus back. And then in verse number 17 and 18, he says, even if, now if you use the word if, it, it, uh, it means uncertainty is involved. So even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering, so if I'm going to pour out my life for the gospel's sake, the reference to his possible death and martyrdom, then he says, uh, I am glad and rejoice with you. This is the last part of verse 17. And then he says, Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. You say, how in the world could someone rejoice? Remember, this is the epistle of joy. How could someone be rejoicing because in, in the face of the possibility of, of being put to death? Well, perspective makes all the difference, you guys. What we understand about who our Lord is and what He's called us to be changes everything. You know, attitude changes everything. How you see things. And then how you react to things. As a Christian, we should have the mind of Christ. You know, how many people kind of like reach that point where you can't put up any longer with someone with a bad attitude. None of you have experienced that? Or am I talking about the church down on the other corner? I mean, let's just be honest about perspective. Let's be honest. How, sometimes people just have a really terrible attitude. And we're going to see in a little bit, and I read it already, where Paul, and I'm not there yet, but I'm just going to jump ahead and bring it into the conversation because it's there. He, he talks about not complaining and not contending, fighting, always fighting, always complaining and murmuring. He'll say that in a minute after we get past these passages. But at the beginning of this, he, he says, hey, I'm glad and I rejoice with all of you. You're glad and you rejoice with all of us. Hey, dude, you're, you're possibly going to be um, martyred. You know what his attitude was? You know what his perspective was? That um, Paul would be put in a position by God that he would be counted worthy to suffer martyrdom for the gospel's sake. He found that to be what he could rejoice in. I mean, think about that for a minute. If he were to die, he thought that would be an honor. That would be something that would bring glory to God, but 
God, you would consider me worthy to die for you, for your cause, for the gospel? That's where he found his joy. Man, I would hope that God would find me worthy for anything, much less to die for him. Amen? You guys see where this is, the, where the ground floor is on his attitude? Yeah, that's another cliche, and I'm going to probably be full of them today. This is, your attitude determines your altitude. How many of you like to be around people that have a really positive attitude? You know, people that are encouragers, and they see possibilities instead of looking at something negatively, and, de and they look at it with defeat. When we belong to Christ, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ, is what Paul would say to the Romans. We live from the disposition of victory. We already have it. And if we go through some difficulties, that's all right. The Lord's allowing it. But he will meet us there, and he will give us the strength and the wisdom there to pass through and to maintain, or we hear the word sustainability so much these days, right? It's always in reference to energy. But what about Christian energy? What about vitality, the vitality of the Christian? Well, we, we, we will be sustained. He's going to keep us. Going back to the, way, way back to the 70s. I was there. You just got to keep on trucking. That was a very popular statement. You got to just keep on trucking, right? Right? Someone here knows about that. Those of us that go back a few years. And then there was a, that was also something that you would say on your CB radio. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? Well, that's all we had. We didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. We just had, if you wanted to communicate, and the truckers especially, they had these radios on board. They would communicate through that and they would just say, hey, you've got to keep on trucking. We've got to keep on moving, no matter what's happening. Because at the end of the day, we as Christians are aware, Paul's aware, and he's sharing this with the Philippians, and he's saying to them, hey, I hope I'm going to be able to see you, but I don't know what's going to happen with me. And hey, even if, uh, meaning there's some uncertainty in in this situation but whatever that is i rejoice and i consider it uh, uh an honor that god would count me worthy to suffer for him wow what an attitude and some of us complain just because we have to get out of bed and i thank god the minute i open my eyes i've learned the older i get i open my eyes and i say thank you lord for another day of life amen I wonder what you got in store for me today. Well, let's go take it on the day. Bring it on. <laughs> and when you go through battles and when you go through trials, tribulations, you have a history of God's faithfulness in your life. And if he was there for you then and in the past, he will be there for you today and he will be there for you tomorrow. And whatever it is you're facing, I can't get past that we not lock in the context of this letter. Paul is waiting to find out what's going to happen to him. So, remember that he understands that if he were, if he, if he to continue to live, he's going to live for Christ. And if he were to depart, uh, he says, hey, you know what? I'm going to be with Christ, which is far better than me staying here. Wow. In other words, eternity is on my breath, literally. And my last breath, I wake up there. That's our story, church. That's our story. That's what we believe. And if we don't believe it, then we would be like Paul would say to the Corinthians, if Christ be not risen, because if he is, then we also will rise one day in the resurrection, right? But if Christ has not been risen, 
We are of all people most miserable. Let us go eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow all that waits is death and then there's nothing else. That's called annihilation, the attitude. No. Eternity is really eternal. We are children of eternity right now. We are citizens of heaven. Now. The kingdom of God is here now in us. We are representatives of that kingdom. Man, I'm trying to lift us up to a whole other way of thinking, church. Come with me. Because the world is down in the dumps right now. They don't even know what to believe. They don't even know what they hear is true with everything that's going on. False news spinning the narrative to fit whatever is convenient for whomever is trying to spin it. You don't know, but you know what is truth? Christ is truth. And we can stand on that. So that's my introduction. Paul's going to exhort the Philippians starting at verse 12. That means he's going to give them some instruction. Um, he's going to uh, teach them some things, right? So this is that part of the scriptures to where we have some practical um, uh, lessons, if you will. Those are good, right, teacher? Practical lessons for life. Okay, because we've got to face life. So, whenever we find Paul giving instruction, whenever Paul is teaching, whenever he's given a lesson, that, that, those things must be transferred into daily action. As a Christian, we can't just hear God's truth and, and, and soak it in. Uh, we can't just be, uh, 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 have our brains filled with information. That information isn't then transferred into daily action. It means nothing. And if he's going to teach us, then those teachings must be expressed in our practical, down-to-earth living. Because after all, he called us to be his witnesses. The world is watching us. And through us, they see Christ. Amen? So, verse 12, Therefore, what is he making a reference here? I will say, I'll show you. He says, My beloved, he, he had a, a nice relationship with this church. He calls them my beloved. As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence when I was there with you, but also much more in my absence now that I'm not there with you. So the first thing we've seen here, he's asking them to obey. And he's making a reference to verse 8 of the same chapter that we saw last week. He's going to talk about what he mentioned in verse 8 concerning Christ. And look what it says. And being found in human form, referring to the incarnation... We saw that last week. He, Jesus, he did what? He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Obedience is impossible without humility. Service to, to God, ministry for God, is impossible without humility. Because as John the Baptist said, when he was preaching and announcing the coming king and said to the uh, Jewish people, make the path straight. Your king is coming. Right? Repent. What he is doing here and what we see is John the Baptist understood, I must decrease so that Christ may increase. Christ becomes larger in our lives the lesser we become. Right? Uh, uh, what do you mean, Pastor? That's what he's talking about when he says to take up your cross and follow him. The cross was a symbol of death. We die to ourselves. We die to our will. We die, I'm going to say this, and some of you might say, it can't be possible, Pastor. We die to our dreams. And they, our dreams and our will become his. But his will for us is way better than our will for us. And his dreams for us are unmanageable. They're way better than what we could ever dream of. 
He created us and He knows exactly what we're built for and what we can do or not do and where we'll be happy. Our temperament, our personality, everything about us, He created. Our abilities, our talents. So it's always better to take up your cross and follow Him. What I'm going to say is it's always better to obey Him Go ahead and try it the other way if you want. I mean, I'm sure some of you have. You know. I did it my way. Frank Sinatra. No, I'm not going to be joining um, Cassandra on the stage for the worship. (laughs) He did it his way. And guess what? In the song, that's all honkadori, right? And beautiful and wonderful. But in real life, the best way is Christ's way. The best way is to take the hand of Jesus, take up our cross. What that means is follow me. And he said that. And so here we see that Paul is making a reference to obedience, but in the very same chapter where he showed us that Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who was in, always in eternity, had never known anything outside of being in complete uh, harmony and unity with the Father. He stepped out of heaven into this fallen, corrupt, wayward world, and he became a sacrifice obeying the Father's will so that we might have our sins forgiven through His uh, offering of His life in our stead. Obedience. He said He became obedient. Verse 8, to the point of death, even the death of the cross, even the death of that cruel cross. And what happened because of that? Because of his obedience, God therefore exalted him and bestowed upon him a name uh, above uh, every name so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what, ha- what is the, re- what is the uh, consequence or what is the fruit of obedience? What is the product of humbleness? He was exalted. So in the Christian mindset and perspective, Jesus said, if you want to be great, then you've got to be the, the lowest servant. If you want to be number one, you've got to be the last one. It always works opposite of the way the world works. If you want to get a promotion at work, you've got to step on the people below you and make sure they're nice and under your, the heel of your foot. It doesn't hurt if you gossip a little bit about them too and make them seem worse than they are. In this world, hey, talk about them, talk bad about them, put, manipulate them. Hey, I've got to do what I've got to do. I've got to take care of number one. That's how the world works. Just look at politics. Just look at what's going on. Somewhere, somehow, our politicians, and I'm going to tell you, I'm, there, it goes both ways, whether you're blue, red, or pink, or whatever colors there are. Red, oh, green. Somewhere along the way, They care more about their personal agendas than they do the American people. Period. That's what I'm going to say. Somewhere along the way, it was about getting this position, whether in Congress or the Senate or, or even in the executive office, and somehow having information and power to be able to help themselves out guarantee their futures and secure their retirement you know they just got like a 21% raise uh, that's going up pretty soon in the middle of this inflationary crisis what am I trying to say people who are selfish self-absorbed don't care about others. 
and they exalt themselves. But those of us that belong to the Lord, we don't care about lifting ourselves up. We humble ourselves in service and love, trusting God, and God's the one who lifts us up. Wouldn't you rather have a promotion from Him? You know why that's the best kind of promotion? Because no one could ever take it away from you. People tell me, oh, you work for, you know, because I teach uh, on my day job. You work for Marina Valley Unified School District. No, I don't. I work for God first. He gave me that job. And no one could ever take it away from me until he's ready to either have me retired or have me do something else. The same is true for you. When we trust the Lord, when we obey the Lord, when we submit ourselves to His will, and we're learning what His will is, humility is His will. And therefore, in, in the attitude and perspective and in our uh, humility, the Lord lifts us up. Because He knows now what our motives are. They're not self-absorbed. He knows that we care about Him. And wouldn't He put in your hands greater responsibility for His kingdom's benefit, knowing that your heart is right and your, and your uh, desires are right? Of course. God's not a fool. He's not going to give to someone a treasure that he knows will waste it. So we want a promotion. We want more responsibility to whom much is given, much is required, but he won't give the much because much is required to the one he knows that can't be responsible with it. Jesus is our example. The one who is the highest, King of kings and Lord of lords, became the lowest. And what did the Father do? Three days after his obedient submission to death, which was our redemption, he rose from the dead. Talking about exalted him. So in this passage, we see Paul saying, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, and this was a church that was obedient, they didn't have a lot of problems, but notice the way obeyed, the word the way obeyed, the word obeyed. Sometimes that's a, like a, I'm like a nasty word to people. Obeyed. So now, right? You have always obeyed. So now continues a continuation. Not only as when in my presence, but much more in my absence. And then here's the key of this whole, I believe uh, another key in this uh, chapter. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's telling them, the Philippians, to work out their own salvation. It's personal. Own, it's your own salvation with fear and trembling, with respect and with reverence to God. Work out your own salvation. Right? Now, there's a way I could translate this. Instead of work out, put the word live out. Same thing. I could read it that way. Live out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Or let me do it this way, because this is what uh, I want you to remember. This verse, he, you could act, activate your salvation with fear and trembling. See, because you have to participate in it. We have this gift that God's given us freely, but we need to see that salvation, once we've received it, is evident in practice in all the different areas of our life. In other words, if we have it, we've got to show it. We've got to demonstrate it. And the work comes out. The fruit comes out. We've been talking about that since we were in Galatians. To live out our salvation our salvation, in this case he says your own. Have you ever looked at your salvation as your own? In a very personal, intimate way with the Lord? It's you and him. That's work. He, for him, <laughs> not for, he's got to work with you. He doesn't work with you? 
I'm only saying, the only reason I think confidently I can say that is because I know he has to work with me. I know he has to work with me. Does he have to work with you? Do you have to work it out? There's a, that's one way to see it too, work it out. Right? We know that he does not mean work so you can earn your own salvation because that would be complete contradiction of his whole, all his letters. Right? He's not saying to work out or to work so as to earn our salvation because we know that our salvation, our salvation is by grace and by grace alone. We know that uh, the seed of salvation has been planted in the soil or the garden of our hearts. And Paul understood that this salvation would bring out fruit. The seed of our salvation has been planted in the garden of our hearts and that seed, like any seed that falls to the ground, is going to produce what? Fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit of salvation. So he's saying, let that work out. Work it out. It's not a reference to salvation by works, which some people interpret. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says that by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And this, salvation is what he's referring to, is not your own doing. But he also could be referring to that what's not your own doing is God's grace also, which is God's unmerited favor. And he also could be referring to this is not your own doing to the faith through which uh, you've been saved by grace. Everything is through God. It's not our doing. It's the gift of God. So when we work out our salvation, we activate the gift of salvation that's in us. We live it. And what we see is the evidence that we're saved. Amen? Not a result of works so that one may boast, nothing to brag about here. If we're going to boast, if we're going to brag, we're going to boast and brag about Jesus. You ever run into people that all they do is talk about Jesus? I'm serious. Even as a Christian, sometimes you might go, man, th that one got something, got some fire lit up in them. Because I don't even like, talk about Jesus that much. That must be one of those holy roller hallelujah kind. I don't know. It's a gift. He's given us this gift that has eternal consequences. We should be on fire. And then he says, it's not a result of work so that one may boast. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. We've been created for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what Paul uh, is saying when he says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He's also referring to what he said in chapter 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, the good work of salvation, will bring it to completion. He's going to finish what he starts. So Paul is wrapping the, the thoughts in this uh, epistle about God's work in you that he'll finish it, that he'll complete it, but he'll take it to the finish line. But you have to humbly and obediently submit to that work that he started in you. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens because you yield yourself. Just like you yield when you get on the freeway. You kind of merge in like a nice little citizen that you are. You don't cut people off. Right? That, uh, not, not anyone here. You yield. You kind of just go and fl go with the flow. And just, you just mesh right in. That's how it is with the Lord, right? We just kind of go with His flow. We don't fight. We don't complain. We don't resist. We don't rebel against Him. No way. Or do we? No. I think it's important. Verse 13 says then, and look at it, how it works. It's, uh, it says, um, uh, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in, in my present, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then verse 13, he says, 
For it is God who works in you. You know why you should work our, we should work our salvation with fear and trembling? Because it's God who works in us. Amen? John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. So let's look at this analogy of how it is that God working through us with a vine. He says, you, I'm the vine, so he's the, 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 the big uh, roots and, and he's the trunk, if you will. And we're the little branches, right, that flow off of the trunk and the, and, and the roots. And he says, whoever abides in me and I in him. In other words, we're, we're going with the flow. We're, kinda, we're with him. We're cooperating. We're yielding. And he says, he it is that bears much fruit. See, you got to go. I, I didn't even think about go with the flow when I was studying. It came up just now. But we're talking about obedience, right? We're talking about humility. He says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So we got to be what? We have to abide with him. We have to cooperate with him. So, let me kind of finish this off. Muller uh, one of the uh, fathers of one of the fathers of theology he says we must work out what God in His grace has worked in. Okay, He got in. Now He's got to get out. Here's my my point, church. Let Jesus out. Let Jesus out. And let the world see him in you. That, that's the message. Spurgeon, another uh, pastor from back in the 1900s, 1800s actually, late 1800s, says, grace all sufficient dwells in you, believer. God's grace dwells in us. There is a living well within you springing up. Use the bucket. Then keep on drawing, like drawing out the water. You will never exhaust it. There is living source within. Do we have a living source within of water? Eternal water, springs of eternal water in us when Jesus is present in our lives. And what the Lord's saying is, hey, drop that bucket in there and start pulling that water out. And you will see it never ends. You can never exhaust those blessings. Right? But you got to go to the spout where the blessings come out. It's there. It's in us. The spout, or we just got to open it. We cooperate in humility. We obey what God has asked for us. So, it, it, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The New Living Translation says, For it is God who is working in you, giving you the desire, that's the will. So he gives us the desire, the will, and the power that pleases him. The will and the work, the power, the work. It is God who energizes us. It's God who gives us vitality, right? Amen? To do, that's the will, uh, or rather, uh, the, the, to, that, that's the works coming out. And, the, the, and when he talks about the will, he's talking about desire. So all our desires and all that we do come from him. We have to allow him then to work out. Very interesting verse in Acts 1.8. He says to the disciples to wait in, uh, in Jerusalem after his ascension into he heaven. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come to you. The word here, dunamis, is the word used for power, which is the same word we use for dynamite. Dunamis, dynamite. You will have dynamite-like power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So God promised the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he would give us power. But what kind of power? Dynamite power. And what's, that, what's the point of it? And we might say, and? So that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And to the end of the earth. 
So you got the power. Amen? Don't look so powerful today, you guys. <laughs> so, let me just go one more place here and then we're going to wrap this up today. He says then in verse, after telling us all that we just read, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Grumbling would be like complaining and disputing is like questioning. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Was he grumbling and disputing while he waited for his sentence in the prison? No, he was what? Filled with joy, genuine joy. See how the perspective changes everything? See how when you know God is in control, changes everything? Who is grumbling and who is complaining? Who is questioning here? He's saying don't, as believers, don't do that. Why? Because then it's not the situation that you're grumbling about or a person you're grumbling or complaining about or the circumstances that you're questioning. Who are you really questioning? And when you're complaining and when you're grumbling and when you're arguing, who are you really complaining to people? To God, because you belong to Him. And that offends Him. It's the same thing that Paul uh, uh, rather, the same thing that Paul is saying here is what happened in Israel when they came out of Egypt and they were complaining and murmuring when they had come out of in, in the Exodus. He's referring back to that, and there's a verse to follow, and I'll share it with you later in this very epistle, in this very chapter, that's a reference out of Deuteronomy. We're not to complain. We're not to argue. Because this is an attitude not against our circumstances or against people. It's really against God. Because you are bought with a price. And that is the blood of Jesus. You are not your own. We belong to Him. So what happens in our lives, whether it's a prison sentence or we're waiting for a, a decision of the future of your life or anything else, which I would find to be much less than that circumstance, God allowed it. God put you where you are right now. He's in control. So what we're to do is we're to praise Him with a positive, we're to have a positive attitude knowing that He loves us, knowing of His grace and His mercy. And yes, because we live in this fallen world, we're going to experience things that are not favorable, but we can still have joy, not because of the circumstances, in spite of it, because we have Christ in our life. And He knows what's best. So, so we don't leave, leave this right there. Verse 15 says, the reason that we're not to be grumbling and disputing, complaining and questioning, because really what we're doing is uh, looking at God, uh, questioning God's providence over our lives. But he says, rather that you may be blameless and innocent, we're pure and uh, we don't have any blemishes, as he says, Children of God. Notice he refers back to us why complaining and disputing and questioning and moaning and groaning uh, so that we would actually be blameless before him. Pure. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. See, basically that's what they do. What kind of generation do we, do we live in? Crooked and twisted. That's a good definition of Corruption, corrupt, criminal, right? Among whom ye shine, you shine as lights in the world. This is, this is a simple statement. Christians are lights in the world. That's what Paul is saying. The question is, how bright does your light shine? Christians would be, in a, in a, as an analogy, like the moon is to the sun, or the sun is to the moon. The, the light of Christ is where the, we get our reflection or our, our light from. The moon gets it from the sun. It's not our light, it's His light. We simply reflect Christ. Amen? And He's saying that's what we're to be. And light 
is the place that we should have in this world. And I'm going to finish with this. Light's a couple things I noticed about light. Light is usually used to make things evident because it exposes. Light is used to guide. Like the Psalms constantly speak about a light, the word being a lamp, which is a light. It's a guide. It, light is used to warm us. So when it would be something, without light, it would freeze. Light brings cheer. Like say, hey, be, you need to be a little bit more lighthearted. Light in that sense. Lights are used to make us safe. Especially from what's unknown in the darkness. So Paul would go on to say, we're to hold on, holding fast to the word of life. Verse 16. So that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. In other words, hey, hold the word of God firmly. Be a light in the world. And that's evidence to me that I didn't waste my time with you. That's what he's saying. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, he's using the analogy of a sacrifice to talk about his death, right? A sacrificial offering of your faith because the reason he was in prison was because he was preaching the gospel. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. You know what he was saying here? Don't be sad for my situation. Because they knew he was in prison. They knew that he might be put to death. Don't be sad. And here goes another cliche to end it up. Be glad. Don't be mad. Be glad. Amen? Why? Because we belong to Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We pray our, uh, your words would um, penetrate deep into our hearts and we would understand, Father, who we are and what is asked of us, Lord, as your children. And there's never been a better time in my life and I'm sure, Lord, in the life of, of this congregation, of each and every one of us, uh, to be a light in a world that's fallen, in a world that's dark, in a world that's lost and confused, in a world that's chaotic. Let us be stable, firm in our faith and in the word and in our walk. And let the fruit of the Spirit be seen and be evident in our lives so as to give hope to those, Lord, that don't know you. So that our behavior, our, our living would provoke people to to want to ask us or, 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 or talk with us about what it is, is it so different about us? And then we would have a chance to share with them about our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, and the hope that we have in Him, and the peace and the joy that we have in Him in spite of and regardless of our present circumstances. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.